My name is Ryan Stone. Uh, I'm from Zanvine. And I'm here to talk about a virtualization technology called uh, PCI SRIRV, uh, single root I.O. virtualization. Uh, I'm just going to jump right into what sort of motivated uh, the, uh, this, uh, this technology. So we want to perform uh, I.O. from a VM. Typically, with SRIRV, we're going to talk about uh, network uh, access, transmitting and receiving packets. Uh, but SRIV is not strictly limited to that. And the typical way that we do this is the uh, hypervirus is going to present a virtualized or para-virtualized device to the VM. And through some memory mapped interface, uh, the VM can send and receive packets or performance I.O. Uh, and, but every time you want to do that I.O., you have to essentially perform an up call into the hypervisor and, uh, and then have it do more work. So for an example, again, of sending a packet, after putting the packet on the memory mapped interface, we have to do an up call into the hypervisor. The hypervisor will take the packet. I believe typically even with vert.io, it's going to have to copy the packet and uh, then send it up through the host kernel stack. So. I mean, techniques like Vert.io have been very successful in getting very good performance, but there's still the problem of there is additional overhead in terms of doing the VM exit, uh, going through the hy hypervisor, you're going to have to go through the host uh, kernel's uh, IP stack and do another routing lookup, do another L2 lookup, so on and so forth, when really you've already done this in the guest. So there, there, it's inevitable that there's additional overhead to this. Uh, another problem is that if you want to take advantage of any advanced NIC offloads. It can be tricky, for example, like TSO. Uh, in order for that to work, the, the, the drive, drive driver for the host in the host kernel has to advertise you know, the support for, say, TSO up to the hypervisor. Hypervisor has to advertise that through the paravirtualized interface for the VM, and then the VM's driver for the paravirtualized device has to support TSO. And then as new offloads come online, like, say, VXLAN or what have you, uh, you would have to you know, go through that whole process and at each level of that, that stack add support. So that can get, that can get uh, tricky. And not all IOS device devices have these virtualized equivalents. Uh, obviously in the term for sending network packets is a solved problem. But you have things like crypto offloads and compression offload uh, PCI devices that you're seeing showing up in Intel uh, chipsets now. And there's no point in doing a virtualized version of that because if it has to be done in software, well, the host can't really do the compression or the uh, encryption any faster than the guest can on the CPU. Uh, but then if you do have that hardware, now there's no way for the VM to get access to the hardware to do the, uh, to do the offload and has to do it in software. So another technique that you can use is called PCI pass-through. And with PCI pass-through, what we're going to do is we're going to give VM, the VM direct access to a PCI device. So its uh, registers will be mapped into the VM's uh, virtual physical, uh, what do you call that? The, anyway, to its, to its physical address space, whatever you would call it. And then the uh, DMA will go through the IOMMU so that the uh, PCI device can DMA uh, memory, DMA memory access can go directly to the VM's address space. So the advantage of this is now, for the, typically for the fast path of you know, sending a packet, it's all register accesses and then DMA, there's no up call to the hypervisor. It's all done in software, in the driver, on the, uh, in the VM, in the guest. Uh, but there are several disadvantages to the approach. The, the biggest one is that it doesn't scale. You have to give a VM complete control of the PCI device. So if you want four VMs, now you need four NICs. If you want eight VMs, you need eight NICs in, the, uh, in, the, in your chassis. And this doesn't really solve your typical, typically when you're doing virtualization, you want to share resources between all your VMs. Well, now you're not sharing, and you haven't really gotten the full benefits of, of uh, virtualization. It's a very useful technique in certain cases, but it's not necessarily generally applicable. So with SRIOV, what we're going to do is we're going to have a, a single PCI device again, and it will present as normal itself to the host OS, uh, and we're going to call that the PF, the physical function. 
and the host OS and the hypervisor will attach a driver to that. But then what SRIV allows us to do is create virtual PCI functions. And those virtual PC PCI functions are completely independent PCI functions and uh, they show up on the PCI tree just like any normal PCI device. But they are backed by the same PCIe device and they have access to that PCIe device's uh, uh, resources. And we can share the capabilities of the PCIe device uh, through these VFs. And so the advantage here is now as we want to add more VMs, we just have to create more VFs up to the limit of the hardware. And then we again, we use PCI pass-through to give the VM direct access. So again, we don't have to do those up calls into the hypervisor. And the, the other advantage that I, I forgot to mention when I was talking about this, uh, sorry, was I was talking about the, uh, the PCI pass-through, is with PCI pass-through, there's also some security concerns. Uh, you have to give the VM complete control over the PCI device. You have no way of restricting what it can do. Uh, so for example, with Intel, recent Intel NICs, you can uh, reprogram the device's firmware through the, uh, the PCI device. Now there, there are some restrictions in terms of it has to be signed and all that, but there's a lot of other things that you could do. Uh, and if you're an untrusted VM, say, you know, in a, a cloud type environment, uh, the cloud provider isn't really going to want to give uh, their customers who they don't really know who they are and can't necessarily entirely trust them, they don't want to give them direct access to the hardware and let them spoof MAC addresses and capture packets that don't belong to them and that might have uh, you know, secure, uh, restricted data in it, that kind of stuff. So, but with uh, SRIOV, because we have this uh, PF device here that's controlled by the hypervisor and that the PCIe device can basically add security functionality and basically the PF, through the PF driver, the hypervisor can configure and limit what the uh, VMs can do. Uh, so that's, that's very important because it, it gives you the flexibility because in, cer in certain environments, in certain cases, you want to be able to potentially uh, capture all packets or, or spoof MAC addresses. It's, you know, it's a limited use case, but it's, it's a legitimate one in certain, in certain cases. So we want that flexibility, but it's, it's not always or, uh, applicable. Uh, so the specification is, it's, it's a PCIe extension and it's similar to the PCI specification that it doesn't say if you are a NIC in order to send a packet the driver must write to register offset 5 with this value and place the data at, at, you know, at, at this, in this part of memory and all that. Instead it says if you want, you know, you, here's how you map your registers, uh, here's how you enumerate devices and then individual implementations sort of give the interpretations of those registers. So. Uh, with PCI SRV, it's the same thing, and what this means is that you need uh, you need to extend the the driver on the host uh, in order to support SRIV. This, so my work hasn't isn't necessarily generally applicable until the individual <coughs> vendor or whoever's writing the driver extends the driver to uh, to give uh, support for SRIOV. Uh, but the good thing is that it gives the, uh, the hardware makers a lot of flexibility. They can, they can add new features like VXLAN offloads and uh, very easily because they get to define how the device works. Uh, but that leads to a bit of a tricky problem when we want to go and configure SRIOV because we have all these different devices, they have all these different capabilities and some of those devices won't be NIC cards. Um, I have seen, at least on people's roadmaps, and they might even exist in the market now, uh, compression offloads and crypto offloads that are SRIV capable. And if you're, say, you know, if, if you're running, say, a cloud services or a cloud type environment or even your own environment, but you want to do HTTPS, having compression and encryption available to you in hardware could really help your performance out. So it's a, it'd be a very nice thing to have. Um, so we're potentially going to have a wide variety of devices, all with their different capabilities. And I don't want the PCI infrastructure to limit or enumerate, these are all the features that you can support. Because then these new offloads come online and you can't take advantage of them without extending infrastructure. Uh, and even worse, pretend if it was hard-coded in the infrastructure, then we have ABI problems, you can't MFC to stable, so the new features can't show up until the next .o release. So I definitely don't want that. But 
I really feel that we want one unified tool for all devices to be able to configure them. We don't want the situation where if you're if you want to configure your Chelsea out card in SRIV, you use this tool, and if you want to configure your Intel tool, we'll use this Intel provided tool, so on and so forth. And that would also put a lot of burden on the driver maintainers to basically duplicate each other's work and uh, and rewrite, you know, reinvent the wheel several times. Already. We don't want that situation either. I'm, I'm much happier having the driver maintainers write interesting features in their driver and extend them rather than writing user land tools for configuration. Uh, so the solution that I basically came up with is do everything through key value pairs. And the individual PF drivers are going to uh, advertise the capabilities of the device through what I call an SRV configuration schema. And the schema is just going to adver- just going to tell you what type of name value pairs we uh, we accept. Uh, the type of value, so you can restrict it to say an integer or a MAC address or a string or, or what have you. Uh, and then we can also make parameters required. Uh, and if they're required, then the, uh, the administrator has to specify them in their configuration file. Or we can make them optional and potentially apply a default value. So to, on the, to the administrators, the advantage of this is that uh, again, it's a single unified configuration file and uh, configuration tool. And to the device drivers, they, they, or the direct drivers maintainers, they offload the work of you know, parsing this configuration and validating it onto the SRIV infrastructure. So it's all done in one place. Um, and one other thing, the parameters you can either apply to, the, uh, to individual VFs or or to the whole PF. So, for example, if you want to encapsulate a, a, NIC, a virtual function NIC behind a VLAN, you could put different NICs behind different VLANs. Some NICs, some virtual functions behind a VLAN, some not behind a VLAN. It's it's flexible in that way. Uh, so that may have been a little abstract. So hopefully this example will clarify things a little. Uh, so this is real world output from the an IXL device. That's the fork fill from Intel. Uh, and we're accepting on the physical function uh, the number of VFs we want to create and the device. So with SRIV, it's in, configuring it on a device is a one-shot deal. You have to, you have to uh, create all your VFs uh, at once. Uh, and that was basically, to, I think, to make the hardware implementation a little easier. And in the config file, of course, you have to specify what device is going to apply to. And then on the VF, we can set it whether we want it to be a pass-through device or we want it to be used by the host. By default, it's not a pass-through device and will show up uh, as a PCI device on the host. Uh, and then there are some device-specific stuff like Mac ad- you can set a MAC address you- and some security parameters around spoofing, promiscuous mode, and whatnot. Um, and you can see that the, the security parameters, they all have a default value because those are Boolean, so it really has to be either yes, you're allowed promiscuous mode or not. There's no optional. But the MAC address, you can leave that unspecified, and then what ends up happening for this driver is the VF or the VM will choose one. Uh, so that was IOV control I just showed you. It's also used to configure SRIOV. You shouldn't really have to invoke it manually. Uh, there's an RCD script that will run it during boot for you, but uh, it's useful to know what it is. Uh, and the, the configuration flow, it's going to get the, get the schema from the kernel, which has been provided by the driver at attach time to the, to the kernel. Uh, it's going to validate the schema for you, pass the configuration up to the kernel. Kernel has to revalidate it because it can't trust user land. Uh, but I, I validated it in user land first because it's much easier to provide good uh, error messages rather than you know, E and val from the kernel. That's not a particularly nice interface. Uh, then the PCI subsystem will create the virtual functions, and finally it will uh, pass the configuration down, the, the, the infrastructure will pass the configuration down to the PF driver and have it do the disp- device specific steps uh, to, uh, to bring up the VFs. Because creating the VFs doesn't really do anything until the, the PF driver has actually allocated resources to them. Um, in the example of Ford Phil, you have to create a, a virtual switch interface. Uh, or something like that, uh, that's basically a, a virtual port on the, the, the switch embedded in the fork build. Without that port, 
you the packets can't can't come anywhere out of the out of the VF. You have to allocate queues, so on and so forth. And that's all very device specific and has to be done through the PF driver. So the configuration file is in uh, UCL format. Uh, it's the same format used by pkg.conf, and there will be a talk on other uh, other system utilities that will be potentially using it uh, soon. Uh, and it's divided into three sections. In the PF section are where the PF uh, the PF global options will go. Uh, those are the the first two op in this in this case the first two options. So whatever it's saying, you can specify this on a PF and the, the schema. And then the default section gives allows you to set default values for all VFs. And then finally, you can have ver per a VF configuration in VF sections, uh, which will override any default values that are either set in the schema or set in the default section. Uh, you don't have to specify a section if it doesn't have any parameters in it. Uh, and you have one of these files for each PF device. So if you have multiple devices, there's just an rc.conf variable you set to a list of, uh, of your configuration files. The names are arbitrary. Uh, I think it'd be a good practice if you named it after the device it's for. And in this case, I'm putting it in a subdirectory under Etsy to keep it all in one place. But that's completely up to the administrator. The names, the directories, it doesn't matter. As long as it's available, you know, if it's in the root partition available during early boot, that's fine. Uh, so I went over these uh, a minute ago. But so these are the these three parameters are specified from the infrastructure and used by it. So they're going to apply to any device. Uh, again, uh, I don't really need to go over it again, but th these ones will be available on any device. And then individual PF drivers will expose uh, more configuration values uh, if they want. And they probably do. So here's a sample configuration file. Again, in the PF section, uh, we, have, we specify the device and the number of VFs we want. Uh, I show an example of why you might want to use the default section. Uh, because say if I'm if I am using this for PCI pass through, uh, and that's the, so a, a Beehive type use case, then I don't really and I'm you know allocating 20 VFs. I don't really want to have to say VF zero pass through true, VF one pass through true, so on and so forth. So the default section will allow you to say all my VFs are in pass through mode. If you want them all to leave behind the same VLAN, if the NIC supported that, you could specify the VLAN there. But then if you have any uh, VF specific configuration that you do want to apply, like say for example, I have a MAC address here, or in my use case, I want one VF to be uh, accessible from the host and not used for pass through, and then I can override the default value in that, in that uh, section. And finally, I don't have to put the VF2 section in if I don't have any specific configuration for it. Yep. Question: Does the format allow you to say for VF dash from star the number fill in the last byte of my MAC address so they can have one? I see. For rule that matches. Uh, I don't have anything like that right now. Okay. Um, but yeah. Uh, pardon? Just talk to Alan. Yes. Yes, it's, it's true. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks. Uh, so. My message to the uh, device driver maintainers is that we need to trade the configuration schema as an ABI. We cannot break people's configuration files in stable. So that means you can't add new uh, required parameters, you can't change default values, and you can't change default behavior in stable. And on head, you can, but I mean, let's try to be nice and avoid it and not just break people's configurations arbitrarily. I mean, obviously, it's, it's always a judgment call. Uh, as to whether these, uh, whether the you know the cost outweighs the benefit, but let's try to not screw our users over. Uh, so, and if you do have to do it, a new de a new required parameter is a little nicer because the uh, the infrastructure will fail hard during boot and just say you didn't specify this required parameter, so I'm not going to let you do this. Uh, that's you know it's a very obvious failure, and if they're paying it any attention at all, they're going to notice it. If you change the value, value, value. Uh, that's a very nasty thing to do because it can be very subtle. And 
things can look like they're working except in this one case. Uh, I'd also like it if we the PF driver is defaulted to the most secure config. So default to the uh, untrusted VM settings where you know don't allow them don't allow VFs to to spoof things or capture packets they shouldn't have access to. Uh, honestly, that stuff covers you know 90% of use cases, if not more. And as long as you provide a configuration that lets the other 10% get what they need, uh, that's that's a, I think that's a much better situation than somebody spinning up their their cloud their cloud provider, not quite understanding the uh, the the parameters here, and then screwing themselves without even knowing it and giving an unsecured configuration. Yes. No, it's per per comp file. I am flying. Sanity check. Uh, there's a dry run. I'm not sure if it goes through the checks or not. Um, there's a demo. Let's find out. <laughs> it's been a, it's been a while since I wrote this. That wrote the tool, so I don't remember. But that would be a good thing to have. Uh, so I mentioned earlier, we need you know the infrastructure is one part, and then there's at least there's at least as much work, unfortunately, in the individual PCI drivers. But that's really not any different from you know, PCI devices, if you go off and buy some random PCIe card and slot it in your FreeBSD machine, if there's no driver there, it doesn't do anything. It's exactly the same for SRIOV. Uh, so the extra IXL driver, which is the Fort Fill cards from Intel, their 40 gig NICs, as well as the new PCIe 3 uh, 4 by 10 gig NICs, uh, that has full SRIOV support. I'm running it in production right now. Uh, so that's fully supported. Uh, the IXGBE driver, which is the older 10 gigabit cards from Intel, it has a technology preview support in the driver. It is, it is compiled in, but what the technology preview basically means is that it hasn't gone through their full QA process. So, uh, yeah, beta core there. Uh, I have had a couple other uh, driver maintainers uh, talk to me about this. There seems to be a fair amount of interest. I believe Chelsea will be doing work on it relatively uh, soon. I don't think they have explicit dates yet. Um, Mellanox uh, also, I promised them this infrastructure a year ago and it didn't show up. So it's uh, my fault, not theirs, that if there's no support there. But I don't know if they're uh, when or if they'll be working on it. Yes? Okay, uh, the question is, and I need to keep remembering to do this, what kind of support is required on the host CPU BIOS in Northbridge? So, I do not believe that we require any BIOS support uh, as of now. The, uh, with John Baldwin's work recently, to, like, the one thing that you sometimes need the BIOS to do is allocate memory space regions to devices. But with John Baldwin's work a couple years back, you know, FreeBSD can reallocate those. Uh, so that that just that just works. Uh, in the host CPU, you're, if you want to do PCI pass through, you need the same thing. So you need VTD. Uh, but other than that, there's really there's really nothing needed. Like these these really look like real PCI devices. Um, so from the from the chipset point of view, SRIOV, as far as I know, does not it doesn't really have to know that it exists. It's really it's really the endpoint that does it because the endpoint just Responds to additional RIDs like PCI triplets. Okay, so like um, for virtualization support in the CPU, a lot of BIOS vendors are are giving you a switch. Oh yeah, that's tr that that's true. Can they do the same sort of thing, or is it just you have to worry about just looking at the PCIe card itself? Right. Uh, the question is, or the comment is that BIOS vendors are often disabling virtualization support by default. Is there any? Uh, could they do anything similar? Uh, to the PCI card. I don't believe so. It, it just shows up as a PCIe capability, and I don't think there's a way for the BIOS vendor to screw you over in that way. But if the BIOS vendor is disabling uh, virtualization, that, so presumably that means VTD, then none of this is going to work anyway. I mean, you could, you could still set up the PCI device, but then there's no, there's no way for the VM to, uh, to, 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 to pass through, right? 
So if the yeah, if VTD is disabled, you can't use it with Beehive. Um, you could use it natively, like uh, as a native device, but that those use cases are a little more specialized than the Beehive use case. I haven't, tr I haven't tried that. Uh, that is how Intel has been testing their VF drivers uh, because they, didn't, they, they had the VF drivers before we had SRIV support in the host. So, uh, so Linux host, FreeBSD guest definitely works. That actually has nothing to do with my work at all. Mine's all on the PF side. Uh, what I haven't tried is FreeBSD host, Linux guest in a while. Uh, once I had the, the native FreeBSD driver, it's a lot easier for me to, to work that way than have a you know, hypervisor in between the two sides. Okay. So I'm just going to go over a couple potential use cases. Uh, the first one, I mean, I already showed this slide, uh, but just to refresh people's memories, you know, we want, we have our Beehive hypervisor and the FreeBSD will attach to the PF and we'll have our VFs created, passed through to the VMs. So the configuration, uh, the, the one, to, I mean, I've really shown this before, but you just have to step pass through to true either in the default section or on individual PFs. Uh, and then there's a, there's a, you can just use the PCI pass through flag to, uh, to Beehive, depending on whether you're using VM run or running Beehive directly or using other wrappers, it's gonna change. But uh, I'll show in the demo in a minute. Uh, but it, it just shows up as a PCI device and you just pass through the, PC, the, the, the triplet, the bus slot function, to Beehive and it will map it in. Uh, another potential use case would be uh, vImage jails. For those who aren't familiar with vImage, it's a, or vImage and jails. Jails is a uh, FreeBSD container style of virtualization technology. Uh, FreeBSD has had this for years. Um, and then vImage allows us to create virtual network stack instances that are independent, that have their own routing tables. Uh, you can have you know, conflicting IPs and conflicting subnets on the different VNets, and FreeBSD just handles that. Uh, so typically, and traditionally, the way that you would set up a VNet jail is you create this ePair interface. And the ePair interface sort of has a, a foot in both VNets. Uh, and that lets you route the packets from the jails VNet into the host VNet and then out the NIC, and then you can bridge it with a real NIC. Uh, but with SRIOV, uh, it, gets, it can be a little bit uh, cleaner. I mean, you're not really gonna see a huge performance boost for anything from this because uh, it's all running on the host, but it seems to me it's just a little bit of a cleaner configuration, so if you had the support, maybe you decide to use it. Might also make the firewall rules a little nicer. I, I'm, I'm not a system administrator. I'm a, I'm a kernel hacker, so I can't really tell people what, what they do and don't want. But this, this, this would work, and I will show this in the demo. Uh, and then, so to configure it, all you'd really have to do is set up the PF. If you wanted to set any VF-specific parameters, you of course could, but that would be sort of the minimal configuration. And then I just have a snippet of jail.conf. I didn't have space for the whole thing. But the key thing is, is that in your jail uh, specification, you have to you know, enable VNet on the jail and then set the, the interface to the vir virtual function interface. But in, th in this case, you're not using PCI pass-through, so it's a host. It shows up on the host. Uh, another use case, which is getting a little closer to how Sandvine uses this, uh, is with NetMap. And I'll go into one of the use cases we have. So at Sandvine, we make equipment for internet service providers. And so we need to test with the type of traffic that you see on the internet, or specifically an internet service provider's network. So we have our own uh, traffic generation solution. And we need to be able to do performance testing with this. So it needs to scale with our product to 10 gigabits a second, 40 gigabits a second, even up to 100 gigabits a second now. And so the traditional way you would do this, and we're not actually using NetMap. We have our own, uh, we have our own NetMap type kernel bypass API, but you could, with NetMap, accomplish the same thing. And so the traditional way you, and then in order to scale it up, you really need 
to, of course, multi-thread it. And typically the way you do that with NICs is you use multi-queue. We talk about that every year at the developer summit, how to, you know, how to make that work better for people. Uh, the problem that Sandvine runs in, run into is that in some service providers network, especially mobile type networks, you have all these different encapsulation protocols. You, like we'll see like MPLS and VLAN and GRE, so on and so forth, all, all this different stuff. And mo not all modern NICs and no modern NICs as far as I know actually is able to unwind through all these tunnels and actually find the foretuple of the, of, in the packet. And that means that the multi-queue is useless to you because it uses the foretuple and it hashes it to choose your queue. And when it can't find it, it puts everything on queue zero, uh, which is a very sad situation. Uh, so, I mean, you can, if you want, try to do uh, in software, spread it out, but then you have to worry about, uh, you still have, a, you'll still have a single thread that's doing that and it can be a bottleneck and you also just have the problem of, of synchronization between all the different threads on, on your software queues. So the solution that Sandvine uses is this interface virtualization where with SRIRV what we'll do is we'll create multiple VFs and give them unique MAC addresses. And then we can attach different uh, netmap instances or what have you to the, uh, the, the individual, individual VFs. And then we just pair them up on the server side and the client side of our test network so that the first instance on both sides will send to each other. And because we're using MAC addresses and, and layer two uh, layer two addressing, you know, that's the very first thing in the packet before any of the encapsulations. So now the NIC in hardware can distribute our packets across our traffic generator, instance, traffic generator instances. And that has allowed us to scale, scale this uh, traffic generation solution way up. Uh, so that's, that's another interesting type of use case that you can, you can use this for. And lastly, I guess I'll have a very long demo because I've been flying through my slides. Oh, no, I'm not quite there yet. Right. Can't forget this slide. I uh, just want to give a thanks to uh, several people. You know, a project of, of this magnitude doesn't just happen in a vacuum. And uh, so a big thanks to my, the people who took the time to review it, especially Mark Johnson, who was at Sandman at the time, and uh, Sean LaHood who spent hours reviewing my code and then even more hours locked in a meeting room with me as we walked through the code again line by line. It was long, it was painful, and they don't get any of the, uh, you know, any of the credit at the end, but you know, it's a big help uh, in getting this, this to the quality level it needed to be. Uh, John Baldwin, Jack Volgan and Vogel, and also Eric Joyner at Intel. Uh, John helped review the PCI subsystem, made several very important suggestions, picked up on some very important bugs, some nasty ones, and uh, was a big help. And Jack and Eric reviewed the patches to the Intel driver and made sure to get those uh, shepherded into the tree. Uh, several members of the FreeBC documentation team were a big help with my man pages getting them whipped into shape. Uh, I learned a fair amount about Mandoc in the process, so thank you. And I know I'm forgetting several people here, but uh, many people uh, chipped in here and there and pointed out stuff. And uh, finally, I uh, do need to apologize to all the poor subscribers of FreeBSDNet. Uh, when I created the 21 reviews in Fabricator and subscribed net to it, I did not at that time understand the uh, level of spam that Fabricator produces. Uh, so I do apologize and uh, thank you for your patience and I have learned my lesson uh, and now if I have something that NET might care about I will forward the uh, initial email to it and uh, thereafter if you want to, if you care you could subscribe to it yourself. And finally thanks to Sandvine who were very supportive from the start of this work and getting this work into FreeBSD. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great thing for Sandvine, it's a great thing for, uh, for FreeBSD to have this work done. And now, I have my demo. Uh, so it's a pretty simple setup. Uh, I have two machines. First one, and this is sort of my uh, virtualization host that we'll be doing the, the, the demo on, is TPC C121. Uh, and I will show uh, 
you know, using the, we're using a VF natively, using VF from a jail, using it from a VM, and then I just have this TSW C612 uh, as sort of an endpoint. And uh, thanks to uh, Dylan, who, uh, who was my remote hands at Sandvine, as uh, George was calling them yesterday, who uh, got this set up for me. All right, I just got to figure out how to get out of this. Fortunately, I forgot before the conference. Oh, wait, is it still open? Is this still here? Yeah, I didn't think so. All right, bear with me a second. Forgot before the conference to actually figure out how to get the, uh, the dual output from my FreeBSD uh, boot to work. And then I got here, I'm like, oh, I have no idea how X works. So here I am in Windows 8 having no idea what I'm doing. Oh, sorry, is there a question? No, no. Uh, just stretching? OK. Uh, go right ahead. Yes. So, IHL v3, where does that one go? Uh, okay, so the question is, how are the names determined? And so the naming is mostly, is, you know, it's sort of a cooperation between the individual uh, VF driver and the, 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 the device subsystem. So it's, the device subsystem is going to enumerate the PCI devices and if they're not set as pass-through devices, it will attach the host driver to them. So the first, uh, the first host attached uh, instance will show up is driver name zero. Next one will be driver name two, one. Uh, now I think the Intel VF driver has the interesting property that it has reused the IX name. So then, if you ha you'll have the host IX zero, IX one, like the, the the native devices, the PFs, and then I think you're going to start showing up as say. IX2 might be the first, uh, the first VF device because unit zero, unit one got used by the the PF driver. Uh, so it's uh, out of the hands, unfortunately, of of my infrastructure. It's really up to the uh, up to the device subsystem. Now, when it's within a VM, uh, it's going to show up as you know IXLV zero, and if you map two in, there'll be zero and one on each on each uh, VM. I have I have no idea because that's all controlled by the VF drivers, which were mostly in place before my work was done. Uh, I think the way that the Fortful driver works, where they just add the V at the end, uh, was that's a that's a nice and easy to remember uh, convention. So I think I would encourage driver writers to uh, stick with that, but. Okay. Now, how is the text size? And I have two different sizes. Is this is this window readable from the back? Yes and no. I don't think I can make it any bigger, so I think you're gonna have to live with it. This isn't a very high resolution output. Uh, this one probably not readable. Uh, let me just fix that. Can I change that? Okay. I have one terminal to work with. I guess I can switch between switch between the two if I really need to. Uh, okay. So here's our TPC C121. Now, if you want to see what uh, 
what PF drivers are currently attached and are available for us IV, you can ls slash dev slash IOV. So you can see that on this machine I have, I actually have a quad uh, 10 gig port. Uh, only IXL0 is actually uh, wired up, but that's the hardware I have. And that's, uh, those are physical? Those are, those are physical, those are physical ports, or PFs, physical functions. And these names here are exactly what you want to put in the configuration file. Uh, which I'll get to in a second, but before that, uh, if you really care, you can look through, you can look at PCI conf to look at the, uh, of course, PCI conf, you can look at the, capabil the PCIe capabilities of the system with PCI conf. Uh, you can see that in the middle there, SRIRV is now decoded. Uh, one thing you know, this is, this is just reading it, the capabilities out of the device. So this doesn't tell you that uh, SRIRV is actually supported in the PF driver, it just tells you the device supports it. Uh, the only thing that typically people are going to care out of all this information is the second line here, which tells you the number of supported VFs. Although even then you have to be a little bit careful uh, because, for example, with IXGBE, I believe it advertises like 64 VFs are supported. But in order, if you wanted to actually make that work in the PF driver, the PF driver would actually not be able to allocate any receive queues for itself. Uh, so the, the driver will actually end up limiting you even further. Uh, and it depends on how many queues you assign to VFs as, as to how many uh, instances you can create. But this at least gives you an idea of what the hardware limit actually is. And the rest of this is pretty technical details that's really just for my own debugging purposes. Now, we can look at my configuration file. I think we've seen this 20 times now. Uh, but again, uh, the IXL0 is just what you grab out of slash dev slash IOV. Uh, and then, as I said, I want to use VF0 for the host. I'm going to use VF1 uh, in the jail. So those ones I don't want to pass through devices, but everything else I want for VMs. So I have my default value for pass through as true. And I mean, you already saw a slide doing exactly this, but that's how to read the, the schema. And now, if I, uh, yes. Is, is there a way, uh, or maybe this is you know, a, a feature request, uh, to get uh, a little bit more detail as to what the options actually are? Like, uh, the blank is, okay, yeah. pass through is obvious, yeah. allow slash max, allow the public key, allow kind of obvious. Max entry key is, is not immediately obvious. Yep. So, so um, yeah, I've thought about that. Uh, at, the, at the minimum, I want uh, these options to be documented in the uh, man page for the device. Okay. Uh, but I actually owe Eric and Jack that patch, so uh, I'm not even be being a good example here. Okay. Uh, it would be possible. Ultimately, this data comes out of the driver, so it's a little, it's not the greatest place for it, but on the other hand, if it's, it's sort of like, I suppose it's like the syscontrol descriptions. Yeah, exactly. So that, that, that does make sense. Um, I'll have to think about what to do about the API to make that happen, but I do think that makes sense. I'll follow that. <laughs> All right, if you can follow that bug, like, let's see, I still have time before the merge window because I really don't want to MFC without that API in. Sorry, I literally follow that right now. Sure. Uh, okay, that's the schema. I've shown you the config file right, so now, how to create a the the VF. So you have this you have this RC conf variable, IOV control files to that specifies what config files you want, and then either at boot or because we don't want to wait five minutes for this Dell BIOS to start. Okay, so, and now if I go look in PCI conf, 
little unfortunate that it wraps, but you can see that these bottom four entries are our new PCI devices. Uh, so the first two are attached to the host driver. So they're IXLv0, IXLv1. And then the next two uh, use the pass-through driver for Beehive, the PPT driver. And you can see that these are all actual PCI devices. So this is 5, 0, 16, 17, 18, 19. Uh, and they share the same PCI bus parent as their parent device. Um, and of course, now I have my devices in IF config. So, oh, the, oh, of course, this, this laptop comes with a numeric keypad. It's wonderful. What it doesn't come with is a lead for the numlock key. Apparently, that was too expensive for a laptop this big. Yeah, I know. I'm sure they uh, save themselves all kind of money, all kinds of money. Um, and there, look, ping works. Done. <laughs> uh, and just to show that I, this isn't some. Wait, that's the wrong one. If I could type, it would help. And we can see that packets are really are coming out of this thing. Um, and similarly, I have my jail.com file. And I have a test jail in it with VNet enabled. And the interface I want to pass through it is IXLv1. You can tell I copied and pasted this directly into my slides. It's the best way to make sure it works. Uh, and the rest of this, again, I'm not an administrator. I copied and pasted, pasted this from the, from the internet. I hope it is somewhat correct. <laughs> it's correct enough that the jail seems to exist, so I'm happy. And then... I can start my jail. And then I can go into my jail. Jxec one. Now that I'm in my jail, we can see that I have just the past, or not really pass through, but the act of starting the jail has moved this IXLv1 uh, port into the VNet for the jail. Uh, so actually, if I go back. This is back on the host again. You can see that the V1 port has disappeared because it's no longer in the, no longer in the host uh, VNet. It is now in the, the jails VNet. So now it shows up there. Excel V1. And Surprise, surprise. I can also ping from this guy. And finally, I have a VM image. Come on, isn't it user VMs? Oh, it's user VMs if I go to the host again. Let's see if I can remember this. Uh, What's a bad start? User source example. Oh, uh, user examples. How am I doing here? Share. Yep, thank you. User share examples, beehive, VM run. Uh, I had this written. Oh, right. Fine. And then with VM run, I can pass my disk in. And then it's dash p, uh, it was, I can't remember the triplet. 
And then I just choose, this, this is the PCI triplet you use to pass to, to uh, Beehive. So if I want to pass through the first one, for example, I do 5018, and then I just give it a name. And now we can see that uh, in, the, in the VM, as we just discussed, the virtual instance uh, has been uh, attached as the IXLv0, because this is a completely independent uh, VM. So it always starts attaching at zero. And once again, I have network connectivity through PCI pass through from my VM. Thank you. So does it look like this thing is a little slower than the one from the build? Uh, it's certainly possible. Let's see. So let's see. Yeah, it's around. 90 milliseconds, and let's see if we can scroll back and find it. Yep, so about a factor of three, and then I bet that the jail is about the same speed. Yeah, and the jail and native are about the same speed, which makes sense because it's native. Yeah, and the, I, the additional latency, I wouldn't be surprised if that's just the interrupt latency, um, because in order to uh, with uh, PCI pass through, the interrupt has to be, at least with this version of the hardware, the interrupt has to be received by the host OS and then injected into the guest. So there is some additional latency there. I did get ate up time beautifully. All right, so if I have, if there are no further questions, that's the end of it. Thank you.